So before I start, um, I kind of always love to know who I'm talking to. So um, just a quick show of hands. How many of you have seen or heard a Chicago a cappella performance before? Wow, quite a lot of you. Great. And how many of you uh, are singers or sing in a chorus, have sung in a chorus, used to sing, maybe still do? That's great. Those are our people. So for those of you that already know about Chicago a cappella, I hope I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit of some things maybe you don't know about the history of the organization and uh, some things we've done and some things we plan to do. Um, and for those of you that don't, of course, I'm happy to give you this introduction. So by way of introduction, um, I'm actually going to start with a uh, short video to do my work for me. So here we go. Chicago a cappella is an accomplished vocal ensemble made up of 10 classically trained singers, five women and five men. The group sings every style of music imaginable from early medieval and renaissance works through contemporary music, vocal jazz, a cappella pop, folk music, and they do all of that without a conductor and without instruments. Oh yeah. We are often the band, the backup vocals, and the leads. Uh, but I think what sets Chicago a cappella apart is the amount of musical, historical, and cultural ground that we cover. These singers are extraordinary. I, I sometimes call them the Cirque du Soleil acrobats of the voice because they're all incredibly well trained. They can turn stylistically on a dime. So one minute you'll have an incredibly serious piece of classical music. And then as soon as that's done, 30 seconds later, turn the page, get a new pitch, take a breath, and you're singing James Taylor. And these singers are that versatile. You find yourself enjoying music that you never thought you would before. You look at the title of the program and it does nothing for you, but then you sit through the concert. By the second song, you're, you're in love. Our concerts really, in some ways, resemble a traditional concert experience, but uh, the passion and the joy that the singers bring to the stage, I think, sets it apart from what people think of as a classical concert, and that um, sort of interpersonal connection that the singers have with each other and also with the audience is one of the things, I think, that has helped the group grow all these years and kept audiences coming back. Some of us are career musicians, some of us work in churches, some of us sing in groups around Chicago. We have singers who perform with the Lyric Opera of Chicago, the Chicago Symphony Chorus, the Grant Park Music Festival. A lot of them are accomplished solo singers as well. The singers in our group are also parents, husbands, wives, partners, uh, hard-working folks who consistently bring an A-game to their performances. I would love Chicago a cappella audiences after concerts to walk away with a sense that we love what we do. We love making music and that we love singing. I've spent all my years in believing you, but I just can't get no relief. In my life experience, there is no more powerful, expressive medium than choral music. I have been changed. My life uh, has, has meaning and purpose because of choral music, and I've wanted to always have a professional vocal ensemble on the Chicago scene that does that for the world. That's what Chicago a cappella is. So that's kind of a quick overview of, uh, of what the group does. And um, I can give you just a few more nuts and bolts to kind of add to that. Um, our mission is that Chicago a cappella is an organization uh, that advances the art and appreciation of ensemble singing. Uh, it was founded back in 1993 by artistic director Jonathan Miller, who you just saw. I'll tell you a little bit more about how that started. And we present an annual series of concerts in Evanston, Chicago, Naperville, and Oak Park every season. We also perform as guest artists, uh, both at home and out of town. We create recordings and broadcasts, produce educational programs as well. And we do all this, uh, as you saw, with a, an ensemble of 10 of the area's uh, finest professional singers. As Catherine mentioned, uh, these are folks that you're going to see on stage if you go to the Chicago Symphony Chorus or the Grant Park Chorus. Uh, music of the Baroque, Lyric, Opera, and many other organizations in town. Um, we've been heard quite a bit on the radio, including appearances on uh, Performance Today, which is the nationally broadcast classical series. Uh, we have our own 
syndicated radio special called Hanukkah Celebration with Chicago Acapella that you might hear on the radio around the country uh, in December. And we've recorded nine different CDs, including releases on the Centaur, Sadie, and Gothic labels. Uh, we've commissioned new works uh, from acclaimed composers, including Chen Yi, Rollo Dilworth, and many others. And we've been on tour to, I think it's about 13 states, as well as Mexico, uh, and had appearances at the Ravinia Festival, the Humanities Festival, and the Art Institute. Uh, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about a cappella music and what that is, um, as well as the history and founding of Chicago a cappella, how it sort of grew and developed, and I'd like to tell you also the most fun part, talk about the music that we perform and the educational work that we do. When I got here, somebody asked me if I needed the piano today, and I said, oh, you've got the wrong guy for that, unfortunately. For one thing, it's a cappella, so we wouldn't use the piano anyway. But uh, we are going to get to hear some music. Um, and I understand we'll have some time for questions at the end as well, which will be great. So, uh, a cappella is Italian. Uh, it literally means in the style of the chapel or in the style of the church. Um, it was uh, believed that uh, music of the early church in Rome was performed without instruments in the church. It turns out this actually might not have been the case. Uh, we're now learning. But nonetheless, um, the term a cappella now means simply any music that is sung without instrumental accompaniment. And there's something uh, very unique and powerful about this style of singing. Um, you know, the human hearing system has sort of naturally uh, developed over thousands of years um, to be particularly attuned to the human voice. Uh, speaking, shouting, singing, uh, the human voice has a particularly powerful effect on us in a way that no other instrument can quite manage. Um, and so s singing music, uh, music that consists solely of the human voice, tends to engage our ears in a particularly effective way. There's just an immediate emotional connection with the performers. There's nothing standing in the way between their voices and the audience. Um, and there's a physical, sometimes almost a visceral, uh, response to a perfectly tuned chord sung by a group of singers without instruments. Uh, technically speaking, um, as Jay said, I am a singer, um, and I can tell you that, and many of you know this, uh, singing a cappella is what we call singing without a safety net. Uh, unlike singing in a choir with a piano or an organ or a full orchestra, uh, if you're singing a cappella, the singers really have no one to rely on but each other. Um, everyone has to be constantly listen, listening uh, to the others and be sort of tuned in um, to the other singers in order to stay perfectly in tune. And to make matters more exciting, uh, there's no conductor. So the singers not only have to uh, stay uh, in tune as far as the, the pitch, but the rhythm. There's nobody dictating the rhythm other than uh, sort of that group think that goes into a small ensemble. So that rhythmic precision uh, is really key and that everything is moving at the same time and the music stays together. Um, just as an example, uh, take a listen to, here's an early recording of our ensemble from back in 1996. Uh, this is actually from our very first uh, CD release. It's um, a very difficult endeavor. Actually, that was just five uh, voice parts that you heard there. Um, it requires a lot of rehearsal. And I'm remembering, actually, as we listen to this, because I was in this group I, from the beginning almost. I was on that recording. We recorded that here in Northbrook. Um, are we in, we're in Northbrook, right? Northfield. Northfield. We recorded this in Northbrook. <laughs> A church called St. Giles. Um, so uh, that sort of demonstrates uh, some of that polyphony that, uh, that I was talking about. Um, so here's a, a brief history of how this whole thing started. Jonathan Miller, who you met, 
um, had this idea that he wanted a small ensemble of classically trained singers that could do every style of music imaginable, whether it's early Renaissance music like the stuff we just heard, African-American spirituals, folk music, vocal jazz, pop music, uh, and sing it convincingly and sort of in a way that made sense stylistically so that it didn't sound like an opera singer trying to sing the Beatles, for example. Um, Jonathan grew up singing in the Chicago Children's Choir. Uh, and uh, if you know that organization, it's one of the great choral organizations in the country. And um, that's really sort of one of their uh, hallmarks, uh, this uh, broad mix of styles. So he sort of grew up with that, took that with him, but he looked around and said there's nobody else doing that in the Chicago scene as adults, certainly not with a small ensemble of a cappella uh, singers. He then went on to study early music, like that music we just heard, down at the University of Chicago, and he became sort of entrenched in the professional choral world in Chicago, which is a relatively small world. Uh, knowing the power of a cappella music in particular, uh, Jonathan really did envision this uh, as a small group that sang exclusively without instruments, and that's uh, what we've done ever since. Uh, he held auditions uh, using his own network of uh, folks that he had sung with uh, in town. I met Jonathan because we actually sang together. Uh, we had a High Holy Days job singing in a synagogue in West Rogers Park. And so uh, I remember actually um, not too long after I met him, him describing this idea that he was cooking up. The small group, men and women, really highly trained professional singers that would sing every style of music imaginable. And he asked me if that's something that I might be interested in, in auditioning for. And I said, that's, that's kind of my dream. You've just described my dream. I don't have the guts to actually go do it, so you go do it, and I'll just follow on your, on your uh, coattails. Uh, the concept was actually eight singers, which is more typical. Two sopranos, two altos, two tenors, two basses. Jonathan was and is a very uh, wonderful singer, had a rich low bass voice, so he assumed he would be taking that role. But when he got to the auditions, um, there were two other baritones, actually, that showed up, one of whom was me, uh, that he liked very much, and he didn't want to say no to either of them. So he just said, well, it's my group. I can do what I want. Let's make it nine singers. So he made it nine singers with an extra bass. Um, now, in the uh, recent years, we've actually gone to a 10-member ensemble. So you probably noticed there are five women and five men. So now that's our configuration with three sopranos, two altos, two tenors, and we've stuck with three basses. Uh, from very early on, uh, well, the very first concert actually took place in 1993. That's Jonathan on the lower left there. I don't know who that very young person is next to him in the middle, but he looks familiar. Um, so the first concert was 1993, and we were producing concerts at that time in Chicago and also in Oak Park, which is where Jonathan was living at the time. But we knew we wanted to be on the North Shore as well. So our first Evanston appearance happened in December 1994 at the First Unitarian Church. Then in 1997, we started doing all three of our annual programs in Evanston, as well as Chicago and Oak Park. Uh, that was at First Congregational Church in Evanston. Uh, and four years after that, in the fall of 2001, we moved to Lutkin Hall, which is a beautiful little concert hall, a little recital hall, actually. I think it's still there on the campus of Northwestern University. Uh, and we expanded the concert to four, se uh, four concerts each season. Uh, and then in 2004, uh, we moved our Evanston concerts to the Nichols Concert Hall, and we've been there ever since. This is a wonderful building. I know many of you have seen it and, and attended concerts there. It was originally designed as First, uh, First Church of Christ Scientist. Uh, it was uh, built in 1912, designed by the renowned Chicago architect named Solon Beeman, B-E-M-A-N, the same architect I learned who de designed the Fine Arts Building down on Michigan Avenue in Chicago, where the old Fine Arts Theaters were. Um, and he also designed over a dozen uh, other Christian science churches all over the country. He must have had a, sp a, a very good ear for acoustics, um, because he designed it, as I say, as uh, for a church. But if I understand it correctly, in the Christian science church, it's very much about the spoken word and people standing up without amplification and giving a talk. And uh, you can tell by the way uh, this auditorium is configured. Um, they 
renovated it, as I said, in 2004 and uh, turned it into this absolutely beautiful state of the art 550 seat concert hall. They've also got classes uh, in the back. Uh, and the building, when it was converted, received the Richard H. Driehaus Award for Best Adaptive Use by the Landmarks Preservation Council of Illinois. We always joke about the fact that we wish we could take this concert hall, just pick it up and move it with us wherever we performed, because it's just a really wonderful place to sing. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit now about the development of the organization after those early years. I mean, I think we were very typical of a small nonprofit arts organization. We had this visionary founder um, who just put his blood, sweat, and tears into making the thing go, uh, as well as some money, as you can imagine. Uh, as I mentioned, I was a founding member of the ensemble, and I did have a little bit of a background in arts administration. Um, and so I started working for Chicago a cappella very part time early on. It was one day a week. The office was in Jonathan's house, you know, the second bedroom that they weren't using, that was our office. Um, and the job grew as the company grew um, until the point where I could really no longer reasonably do both things. I couldn't really sing in this group or a lot of other groups and to carry on my job as executive director. But we had no real training, I will tell you, in nonprofit management or fundraising. We learned on the job. Um, in fact, the first board of directors, you know, you have to have a board of directors as a nonprofit. It's the first thing they ask you when you're trying to figure out well, if this is a nonprofit organization. And so you have to have three people. And so that first board was Jonathan, his wife, and the next door neighbor. That was the board because you had to have three names. And I think my title uh, was sort of invented the same way. I remember we were filling out a grant application in those very early days, and I was the one signing it, and it asked for a title. I don't know, executive director. OK, sounds good. So that was how I became the executive director. A few years later, though, we learned about an organization called Arts Bridge, which uh, is a business incubator for the arts. Uh, that was in 1998. It was a really wonderful um, and sort of innovative organization that took these very small arts organizations, gave them shared professional office space and equipment, consulting services. You sort of had this work plan that you worked through. And so it really gave you a grounding in nonprofit management. Uh, and we stayed there about five years until, unfortunately, Artsbridge itself dissolved. But by that time, we felt like we had learned quite a bit about what it took. Uh, and so we actually stayed put. Um, Artsbridge was located uh, in the Athenaeum Theater building, uh, which is a 1911 historic old theater on the north side of Chicago, uh, like at Lincoln and Southport. So that's where they were. And when Artsbridge dissolved, we just stayed put because on the second floor of this huge theater building and the third floor, there's all these offices. So a lot of arts organizations have their offices there, and we still do. Um, and I think partly because of that experience with ArtsBridge, uh, from very early on, uh, we uh, have had a strong focus on organiza organizational development, best practices, um, although certainly we've taken uh, some artistic risks. The organizational side, we've built or tried to build a solid structure over many years of sort of slow and steady growth. So as Jay mentioned, we pay a lot of attention to processes and procedures. We have a strong board oversight, good uh, staff board relationship, a solid budgeting process, a cash reserve with a clear policy. And we've worked very long and hard to develop those things. Um, not because it's fun to do those things, but because we really want the music to continue. We really want the organization to sustain uh, over the long haul. Um, of course, that's never a sure thing in our world of small nonprofit arts, which I think we still are in. Um, it continues to be a risky business, uh, ups and downs, but we do everything we can to sort of mitigate those ups and downs to try to keep the, the ship steady. Uh, still, we are only a half million dollar organization. Um, now, when we started out in 1993, or when I started several years after that, the idea of running a half million dollar organization would have boggled my mind. But I, you know, now see that we are in this sort of strange nether world in the arts world in Chicago. Um, between the very small and startup arts organizations and the big institutions. And we actually don't have a lot of company in this middle ground. Most of our colleagues, whether they're theaters, certainly choirs, dance companies, orchestras, um, 
they're either much smaller, tiny little mom and pop operations, often with no paid staff whatsoever, or they're the much larger established institutions with multi-million dollar budgets. Um, it, one challenge that makes it a little uncomfortable, I would say, to be in that netherworld is, um, you know, we strive, again, as Jay mentioned, we strive for a high level of professionalism, not just in our performances and our music, um, but also in on the business side, in our customer service, in our materials, our branding. Um, and so because of that, some people do get the idea that uh, we're actually a much larger institution than we are. Um, so sometimes I feel like we have the expectations of a much larger institution, but the resources of a tiny one. Um, just as an example, we have in our office three staff members. It's me and two other staff members and a couple of interns when we're lucky. And then, of course, there's our artistic director and our education coordinator, but they really don't work in the office. So the office is still quite small. Um, so if somebody calls us with a problem with their ticket or a question at 7 o'clock on a Saturday night uh, or noon on Sunday, uh, there ain't nobody home. There's no, <laughs> there's no one there. They're not calling a 24-hour hotline or a box office. Uh, of course, we do get back to people quickly, but I think sometimes people have a hard time understanding just how small we actually are. And in some ways, that makes me very proud because I think we're able to accomplish a lot uh, with a pretty tight operation, but it does make things challenging. Uh, so, earlier in that video, uh, you did get a sense, I think, of, uh, for those of you that don't know, what the group sort of looks like and sounds like, but I'd love to um, get to some music uh, and share a few more uh, short audio clips with you, just to give you an idea of sort of the range of music uh, that the group does sing. So here are some four more clips for you.
that's a pretty uh, wide range of music. I think that may be the first time in history I've ever played Avinu Malkenu followed by Baby Love. That's interesting. <laughs> It followed alphabetically in this list of music clips that I've got on my computer, and as I was listening to it, I thought, well, that'll give them an idea of the range from Alvino Malkano to Baby Love. Um, that's really the, kind of the calling card of Chicago a cappella. We've sung in dozens of languages, um, and our concerts are generally centered around a theme uh, with lots of different musical styles on that theme. Uh, we've done concerts about food. We've done concerts on uh, uh, texts by Shakespeare, concerts of Jewish music, concerts about sex and romance. Um, there are generally some surprises, so a concert, for example, on opera that we did uh, included not just traditional opera arias and choruses in a cappella arrangements, of course, but also the Phantom of the Opera and uh, a spoof of Carmen by Spike Jones. Uh, a concert that we did on the Beatles included jazz arrangements and one in the style of a Renaissance madrigal in addition to sort of the more uh, typical pop styles. Uh, a few of my own favorite concerts uh, have included the history of rock and soul with Terry Hemmert from XRT as our onstage narrator. You saw a photo of Terry with the group there. A concert of Spanish music that featured flamenco dancers, one of Argentine music that featured tango dancers on stage with us, and last year's uh, Chicago Chicago concert celebrating our 25th anniversary with uh, music that illustrated the history of the city of Chicago uh, complete with on-screen projections and Jeffrey Bear from Channel 11 as our on-stage narrator. Uh, this performance was actually uh, our opening night on stage at the Pritzker Pavilion in Millennium Park. I don't know if you've seen uh, during the winter time those they have huge glass doors on the front of that stage that close and then the, con the stage itself becomes this wonderfully intimate concert hall. It was really kind of a magical evening. Uh, so what's next for us? Well, this coming season, uh, we're opening uh, next month, actually, with a concert called American Anthem, songs that challenge, unite, and celebrate. This is something that was inspired by and based on uh, sort of an occasional radio series that you might have heard on NPR, uh, heard on WBEZ here in Chicago. They've taken songs that have become quote-unquote anthems for some uh, social movement, a moment in history um, that ranges from the 1970s pop song I Am Woman, which became sort of an anthem for the women's rights movement, um, and we're stretching it all the way back to the Civil War. We found what we think is perhaps the, the first war protest song. Um, and so the singers are going to be telling the stories behind each of these songs and why they are all anthems. Uh, in December, we'll present uh, Holiday's a cappella. This is a concert uh, whose title does not change every year, but the music definitely does. Um, this year, it features medieval and Renaissance music, traditional French and German carols, quite a few songs for Hanukkah, and familiar holiday songs like Carol of the Bells and Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. In February, uh, we're going to be delving into the riches of Mexican music, stretching from uh, Baroque polyphony, not unlike that Renaissance music from Italy that we heard at the beginning, except this is from the Mexico City Cathedral, um, to brand new works that we've commissioned just for us. And of course, Besame Mucho, because how can you have a, a concert of Mexican music without Besame Mucho? And then finally in April, uh, we'll do a concert of swing music. And this is uh, consisting of brand new arrangements of over two dozen swing tunes by Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, and many, many others. Let's see. Concerts, uh, however, are only part of what we do. They're certainly the main part of what we do, but our education outreach activities have uh, grown tremendously. We've hosted a high school apprenticeship program for many years, and our annual youth choral festival brings in high school students from all over the Chicago area for a day of working with the professional singers and directors of Chicago a cappella in rehearsals, workshops, discussion sessions, master classes, and performance. So here's a short video about that program. My students just love this experience. They um, rave about it before, since they've been, they know how exciting it's going to be, how fun it will be, and then after they talk about it the rest of the year. Uh, 
I think they love the connection with the Chicago a cappella singers, that they actually get to sing alongside uh, professional musicians. They get to hear tips um, that are you know, personalized to their choir and, and really like work in depth. It's not just like a, you know, somebody comes in for one 50 minute class. It, it's the whole day of activity. Experiences like this really help. It, it helps make the, the learning meaningful beyond just the classroom environment. It does two things. One, it I think affirms what I've um, shared in rehearsal. And so when they hear it from another person, I think it brings extra weight to it. Uh, but also they hear new ideas, new, new ways of explaining concepts, new, new uh, techniques or strategies or, or warm-up exercises. Um, and I hear the difference. I love when we get to sing and share. So we're going to get to sing some of our music and then share music together. And I love that about this festival. I think that that's really something unique, that they're going to get to sing their own music that they do at home, and then together with the professionals get to sing some stuff. I think that that's really cool. I think it's always interesting when music can connect um, different types of kids. And uh, my kids are from the suburbs, um, so they're not from the city, and the other school that is here is from the city. So I think it's interesting for them to, to meet kids that have similar passions or similar interests but are not at the same place and at home, home is very different. Urban life versus suburban life is very different. This is an important program for high school students because it helps them build a sense of identity and pride uh, that, that they're a part of this bigger community, um, that the, the thing that they've been working on so hard to, to become a better musician, that that's valued by other people. Um, so I think it really affirms my students' interests uh, and it helps them become better musicians. So that is our Youth Choral Festival, one of the programs uh, I would say we're probably most proud of. It's um, you know the day of the year that we all look forward to because we know we're going to be surrounded with these talented young people and uh, they are really uh, quite inspiring. Um, this year that festival is going to take place in January at Rockefeller Chapel in Chicago. Our newest education program is called Cantare Chicago. Cantare, of course, means I will sing in Spanish. And for this program, it's really focused on Mexico. We bring a composer from Mexico to work in Chicago schools as a composer in residence, um, both with elementary and high school kids. Um, the composer works with the students, teaches them about Mexican music and culture, and then goes home and writes a new song for each school sort of based on their interests and abilities. Then he comes back to work with them some more, teach them the song, um, and the composer is in Chicago for a total of four weeks uh, in the fall, winter, and spring, so it's not a short residency. Um, he also writes, he or she, also writes uh, a new song for the professional singers of Chicago a cappella. And then at the end of the school year, all of the students come together uh, with the composer and with Chicago a cappella for a free community concert where all of this new music is performed for the first time. Um, so it has several goals. Um, it encourages and supports school music programs, uh, which as you probably know, uh, need all the support they can get in many cases. Um, it celebrates cultural pride and it develops uh, increased awareness of Mexico's heritage in the schools and in the wider community. It's just interesting to me, we started this program, um, we're about to enter our fourth year, and it was uh, several years before that when we started uh, devising it. It's actually a program that has been done in Minneapolis for about 10 years, and we're sort of uh, franchising it almost from them, a wonderful choir named Vocal Essence. I, had, I don't think we had any real idea when we first started talking about it, um, how timely the program would come to seem. Um, it just seems more vital than ever uh, these days with um, our country's uh, continuing conversation about immigration issues. Um, and the students and the teachers and uh, the parents have really been knocked out by this program. So here's another very short video um, about Cantare. <coughs> unifies many cultures and puts it into one because we are one people. I really like the 
fact that Rodrigo came here from New Mexico just to practice the song with us. It's really nice of him, and I am really glad that our choir program was chosen for this. years I've never really sung like anything really like of my heritage it's always just been like classical and to finally be able to sing something that I can relate to like my bullying in the Spanish language and like you know what the song is about it's pretty cool So that's Cantare, um, and that last shot that you saw is, uh, that was our very first uh, iteration of this program, and that was in Rockefeller Chapel, that incredible um, Gothic cathedral, really, uh, on the University of Chicago campus, and we're going back there for the first time uh, this, uh, this next spring. Uh, the concert for Cantare, the community concert, will be at Rockefeller Chapel on Friday night, May 1st. Um, all told, with all of our educational programming, we're reaching just about a thousand students each year, um, and as I said, they do continue to grow. Um, this coming year, we've got six schools participating in Cantare, and another five in the Youth Choral Festival. Um, um, we just uh, believe that it's important to nurture and support sort of the next generations um, to make sure that they have strong music programs uh, in their school and that singing is a part of their life. Uh, so quickly, before we get to whatever questions you guys have, I do want to look ahead a little bit and let you know what's coming down the road for Chicago a cappella. Um, after 27 years, our founding artistic director, Jonathan Miller, uh, is stepping down. So it's really a, a pretty big transition in the life of our organization. Uh, Jonathan has actually been working very diligently on his newest project, uh, which some of you may be very uh, well aware of. It's a group of senior choirs called Sounds Good. I'm curious if we have any Sounds Good singers in the audience. I'm surprised. You probably will, the next time I'm here, you probably will have some Sounds Good singers. They've got choirs all over the Chicago area now. Now. Um, Jonathan's a wonderful director. It's a, it's a terrific program. And he has now started a new organization, sort of in conjunction with that, particularly for Alzheimer's patients and their caregivers. So there's a special choir now just uh, for those people to serve their needs. Um, so uh, we have hired a new artistic director, uh, Dr. John William Trotter. Uh, he uh, has a background working with the Vancouver Chamber Choir, which is one of the great chamber choirs, uh, and uh, now he's on faculty at Wheaton College. We've worked with John as a guest music director for uh, a number of years, so uh, we know him very well. We're very excited to bring him on as our new artistic director. Uh, he's actually on sabbatical this year. He's teaching at Cambridge University in England, but he's going to take over as our artistic director uh, pretty much a year from now, next summer. Summer. And when he returns, we've got some very exciting programs already in the works. I can't give you a lot of details because there aren't a lot of details yet, but I can tell you that uh, we're looking at a collaboration with the Studs Turkle Archives at WFMT Radio uh, to create some kind of a concert that's based on Studs Turkle and his life and that the rich holdings of his interviews with famous people for many, many years in that archives. It also looks like we're going to have a newly commissioned work by a really wonderful composer as part of that concert. Uh, that work is part of a larger project this composer is doing called Views of Chicago, uh, which is a multi-movement work, which he's writing for nine different ensembles, nine different groups. He's already written something for the Lincoln Trio. Right now, he's writing something for Eighth Blackbird. And we're going to be the, the choir. 
Uh, we also have a new CD project in the early stages with uh, Sadie Records, and we're looking for future concerts with Jonathan Miller. Yes, he's retiring, but he's going to be our artistic director emeritus, and uh, we have some plans for him to cre continue creating some programs for us occasionally, particularly concerts of Jewish music, uh, which is one of his primary specialties. So I'll just end by saying how much I appreciate being able to speak to you today about the thing that I have been passionate about for 25 odd years. Um, the music continues to enrich my life and I hope the lives of many others. And I hope we'll see you at an upcoming performance. I do have uh, some brochures up here which are specifically talking about American Anthem, which is our next one. That's coming up on October 26th. Um, we've got uh, group rates available if you have 10 friends that you'd like to bring or if you're part of an organization that would like to get a group together We've got senior discounts for every concert uh, and it would be great to see you there um, So thank you again for having me and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you Matt uh, I just yeah, I just want to say that was really interesting because I'm, I'm in a household that's very much involved in music, and I've never heard of Chicago a cappella. That breaks my anyway, heart. Great. But yes, I'm glad you do now. <laughs> Any questions? Right here, Jeff. Who does the arrangements for the uh, group? It's such a great question. A lot historically, a lot of the music that we performed is what I would call prearranged. So either it's a classical piece of music, or it's a piece of music uh, that's maybe been written, composed newly for us or another group. However, as we get into the realm of pop music and jazz music and standards, even spirituals and folk songs, as you know, somebody's got to arrange that for a cappella, uh, for a cappella ensemble. Uh, you know, the Shenandoah that we heard, for example, that's a very standard arrangement that a lot of choirs have performed before. You can go out and buy the sheet music for that. But um, as we've developed, this idea of getting things arranged specifically for us has become more important, um, mostly because of our programming. So for example, if you want to do a concert of opera, good luck trying to find a cappella arrangements of opera. Um, so that means you have to find somebody to do it. So we're lucky enough to have a group of, I would say, three to five folks that we work with pretty regularly, um, several of whom uh, have been guest music directors and continue to work with us as music directors occasionally. So we've got a little stable of folks that we kind of are our go-to arrangers. Uh, with the youth chorus people, how do you determine which kids are become part of that? Uh, whoever won, whoever raises their hand first, basically. It's pretty democratic. Uh, in fact, when we started, we weren't really in the education realm at all. So we didn't have a lot of contacts uh, among schools, among music teachers. And so it was kind of tough, honestly, to find schools to try to describe what this was. You know, these music teachers, if you're lucky enough to have a music teacher, these folks are busy, and you know, especially at the high school level. I mean, they've got a million things that they're competing with. They can just barely get through what they're supposed to get through. So to go to them and say, we've got this great new thing for you. You need to come bring your kids. It's out of school. You know, bring them for a day to work with Chicago a cappella. That can be a hard sell, depending on their situation. But as I say, they're growing. And I think as our sort of our, the reputation of these programs has grown, sort of word spreads, because that's kind of its own world. These music teachers know each other often. And so, as I said this year, um, our recruiting was consisted of basically sitting back and letting the phone ring. And we're pretty much full already. So if you know schools you know, that, that might be interested, definitely have them call us because there's always a place for new schools. How often do you change Seegers? Uh, we don't like to change them very often. Um, so we, as I, as I said, we perform with a group of 10. Um, it's relatively stable, but these are very busy singers, and so uh, there's always a little bit of in and out among the roster. Um, once in a while, I remember about five years ago or so, just coincidentally, a lot of the singers had other things that they were doing. It wasn't one thing. This guy had a wedding. This guy's you know, father was ill. This guy was in another show that was going to take him out of town. So suddenly, we had all these sort of non-regular Chicago a cappella singers on stage. Now, the reality is these singers are all fantastic. And it doesn't really diminish 
the quality of the music because the rehearsal period is the same. And in often cases, these are people that we've sung with in other groups around town. Uh, but I think for the audience, that was a shock. Like, where are all my singers? You know, they come to the Chicago a cappella concert and they feel like they know these folks. And to the extent that we've got new folks coming in once in a while, which always happens, um, sometimes that makes the audience a little uneasy, I think. They miss, you know, whoever. They miss their favorite. Uh, so we have to reassure them that, like, no, he's coming back. He was just busy for this concert, but he'll be back. I, I'm absolutely curious about the, the, the mechanics of the synchronization of how you start. I can understand you're on a roll and you all sing together, but how, who starts it? <laughs> Somebody's got to give a sign. No conductor, no light, no signal. No. How's it start? You know, that's, that, that's why we have to have so many rehearsals, because I, I would say about half of the rehearsals, when people hear how many rehearsals we have, which is typically eight before a new concert, that's kind of a lot, honestly, in the professional world. Um, but it's because of that, <laughs> you know, maybe two thirds of the rehearsal time is spent on real musical work and how does this music go and are we tuning the chords correctly and an awful lot of rehearsal time goes into the synchronization and literally how are we going to know how to start together and it's different for every song. It's probably one of the singers who's been selected to give a little nod. Um, but it's not going to be the same singer for every song. Sometimes we don't need a nod because maybe this song, the basses just start by themselves, so they just need to look at each other and take a breath and go. Um, so we try to be as subtle about it as possible, but it takes a lot of planning. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's fun. Uh, many of us seniors have noticed that um, we're a long ways from Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. How? <laughs> How can you and are you beginning to look at rap and embracing the Hamilton uh, approach towards where music seems to be lately? Mm -hmm. uh, you, are you beginning to work with that? Um, I would not say I've, I would not use the word rap or hip hop as they now call it to describe anything that's in our repertoire, which is. Although now that I say that, I'm thinking of an example where, yeah, we did one. We did one. Um, and I was the lucky guy that had to, to try to pull it off, which was not easy to do. Um, generally, though, uh, I don't think that that's going to find its way mostly into what we do. I mean, I, I look at the Chicago a cappella repertoire as um, a pie, and about half of the pie is what I would call classical or traditional music. About a quarter of the pie is what I would call pop music. That could be vocal jazz, that could be Broadway show tunes, that could be sort of more familiar light music American songbook standards. And then the other fourth is sort of the impossible to classify, whether it's folk music, a little novelty song, world music, just unusual stuff that doesn't fit easily. And country, absolutely. So uh, we do try to find you know spaces in the repertoire for, I mean, really, it, it's you know the old, I think it was Leonard Bernstein that said, there's two kinds of music, good music and bad music. And all these other things are artificial. Um, so we do try to keep an open mind. Um, but I will be honest by saying we haven't we haven't gotten very far in that in that area. <laughs> uh, hearing and seeing this group in person, it's downright thrilling. Oh, thank you. And lots of fun. I love the gospel concerts, and I really encourage taking part in this. Thank you so much. It's great to see some friendly faces. I knew there were some people here that had been to concerts before. I have, <clears throat> I've noticed lately that a lot of a cappella groups are fo focusing on the idea of using the human voice to imitate musical instruments. Uh, there's recently, a week, couple of weeks ago in America's Got Talent, there was a fantastic group that did that. And it goes back to groups like the Swingle Singers, too. Right, right. Have you experimented at all with that? We have. Um, we've got, I, I would say, a couple of folks in the group, one in particular, Joe Labazetta, who's our, we call him our vocal percussion go to. So I think there was, uh, well, yeah, that last song that we heard, the, the girl from Ipanema, you probably heard some vocal percussion going on. That was Joe. Um, yeah, it's interesting to me that when we, when the, this group began, you know, over 25 years ago, acapella really didn't mean what it means today in the minds of the general public. Um, 
you had to explain a little bit what that was. If they'd heard of a cappella, they might have been thinking of the college glee club, um, or maybe they were real choral singers and knew what that meant. Today, you say a cappella, and you know what you're describing that what people see on TV in the movies it's just become a sort of a cultural phenomenon that it was not 25 years ago and for us that's great but it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because um, because people think they know what it is they could come to a Chicago acapella concert and say where's all the dancing where's the microphones why where's where's the big production number where's the pop music where's the you know the rap um, so that's not exactly what we are, but our hope is that we can kind of bridge the gap between people who are interested in general in what they now see as a cappella music and the you know imitating instruments, for example, and see when they come to hear us that it's it is that, but it's a whole lot more too. I've enjoyed your performance as Nicholas Hall, but you didn't give yourself a commercial. You haven't said where and when you're going to perform this season. Oh. Well, I just mentioned at the very end. Well, that's the next one. I mean, October 26th is uh, is our opening night. Actually, it's opening afternoon. It's a Saturday afternoon, which we've never done before in Evanston. Um, so uh, we'll see if that if that uh, gets a good crowd. Um, but yeah, October 26th is the first one. And uh, please do take a, a pamphlet with you, and that'll uh, give you all the details about that. And there are three more concerts um, coming up at Evanston later in the season as well. Um, I, I think you get an A++++ in arts management. Oh, gosh, I think your, this presentation, your logo uh, is very memorable. Uh, every, all your video selections and graphics are terrific. Thanks. Makes one want to stand up and run to your performances. I'm glad. I've, I've heard of you before. But I'm also really thrilled about your art reach, uh, your uh, reach to uh, education and music. Chicago Public Schools because these are the uh, we have a huge Hispanic um, population in Chicago they love music I have taught music in Chicago myself to uh, Hispanic children and these are your future audiences uh, yeah. for Ravinia for um, Chicago acapella uh, the symphony and I want to congratulate you oh, on doing thanks. that thank, thank you. you so much for your very hard work and excellence thank you thank so you. much that's very nice There, there are, um, as you do, there are some other a cappella groups that tour. I'm thinking, for instance, of Sweet Honey and the Rock. Oh, yeah. Have you ever considered doing a joint kind of performance with them? I love the idea. Um, who do you know? Set us up. <laughs> Give me their number. Yeah, no, I think it's a, a great idea. And, uh, you know, as I say, groups like that that have this sort of wide following, um, I think there could be a lot of opportunity for us to sort of connect with them in some way. So I think it's a great idea. Okay, I think, Matt, thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.